Is that good or? Yeah, that was money. Yeah, this is gonna be raw and uncut, guys. Yeah, live from <laughs> Wheat Ridge, Colorado. We'll work out the kinks, tell us what works and what doesn't, but for now it's just nothing but good content for Tom. Do we have eight o'clock? Yeah, let's get started. Let's do it. Okay, so I told John earlier today I'd make sure that this question got in there, so I'll ask it first. Can you comment on taking the SolidWorks teachings to the tree stand, saddle, ground blind? So basically, can you comment on taking SolidWorks teachings into the field Absolutely. for a bow hunter? Absolutely. So one of the things that first caught my attention when I was learning target archery, and one of the questions I asked, that I asked my first coach was, okay, we're learning target archery, we're learning all this structure and all this alignment and all this good stuff. And, you know, this was two hours into my very first course, my very first 20 hour course. And I was like, how does target archery, you know, I kind of told them, I have a traditional archery shop. We're bow hunters. Sometimes we're shooting from funky positions. Sometimes we're shooting under a bush with the bow parallel to the ground. How does this stuff I'm learning relate to the stuff that we do as a hunter? How does target archery cross over? Well, this guy was kind of a hard-nosed, crusty old dude, and I, know, I knew him for about all of two hours at the time, and he tells me bluntly, he says, well, you dummy, you take it with you. And I was like, wow, this guy just called me a dummy. I hardly know the guy. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, take it with you. And so basically what he kind of demonstrated is if we're setting up a structure here, you know, with skeletal alignment and all the, the tools that we use to execute a great shot, if I need to shoot that bow under a bush, take this position with me. So as I, I would basically, and what I teach people all the time and what I do all the time now, is we take every position from about your belly button to the top of your head and standardize that. Now if I take that position with a fairly vertical bow or a slightly canted bow like I shoot it, and I need to take that under a bush, I'll scoot back a little bit, I'll literally just take that bow, my head position, everything else. So I'm sitting down right now, but from this position, I can take this bow into any angles that I would like to take this into. So if my you know, upright position in a more of a target stance is right here, and I've got to shoot at this camera right here, here well, I can take this bow with me right into an angle that I can shoot from. So everything that I'm doing here, through my back tension release and everything, is built on this structure that I'm building right here. That structure just goes with me wherever I want to go. My basic uh, sight picture stays fairly much the same. I mean, my visual relationship to the bow stays the same. My draw length stays the same. How I'm activating my shot stays the same. I can lay flat on my back and get into the same position and shoot an arrow. I do that a few times on the solid archery mechanics videos, there's a little B-roll that we put in there of me shooting some shots on my knees. I think I shot one off my back at a target, shot some off my knees with a really leaned over stance in that. So basically it's all the same. You know, if I did have to shoot an arrow under a bush, why wouldn't I want to use the structure that's the same as we shoot at long range? Why wouldn't I want to execute the shot with back tension? with a linear tension that increases through the shot. Why wouldn't I want to do all that if I'm shooting under a bush? Answer is obviously I would. So everything that we teach here applies directly to, to a hunting situation. Get on my soapbox a little bit. In the old days, you know, pre-1970s, uh, all bow hunters were informed from target archery and how to be accurate. It's like any sport, any sport has form. Any sport has ways of using your body which are better and more efficient. And like I said, in the old days we took our cues or we were informed on how to hit an animal, how to be accurate while, while hunting from target archery. I'm just doing the same thing here. Um, tremendous benefit to me personally over the years. My harvest rate, my percentages went way up. So anyway, that's uh, my long answer to a simple question.
All right. What you got next? Okay. I'll pick one from the, from the gallery. They're not commenting much. No? No, no I've yet. been watching it. Okay. Throw some questions. All right, next one from Adam. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell young Tom? I'm assuming he's talking about you, not me. Yeah. What would you tell young Tom to help him along in your early years of bow hunting? Also, what's the best piece of gear under $10? Okay, so first one seems like a bit of a hunting question, and and so I'll, I'll you know I'll talk about the experience of becoming an accomplished bow hunter. Um, that is not learned; it's not learned from a textbook or the internet. That is earned. Um, there are so many experiences I've had over the years as a hunter that you know you just I put it this way: you just have to make a bunch of mistakes. You have to just inventory through mistakes in your hunting career to get to the point where you find out how far you can push it, when you need to set back a little bit. And those are hard-won lessons with animals in front of you. Um, you know, there's some general advice like to elk hunters. I mean, we've got to cover a whole bunch of big country to find elk and say we find a feeding bedding pattern in a drainage. Well, it doesn't take a lot of pressure um, from human, uh, just humans being in that drainage lay scent down and have elk move out of that drainage and a lot of people and this is a big mistake i did early in my hunting career um we kind of beat a dead horse if i get into a drainage and man we're into elk all day the first day and the second day there's less and the third day there's less sometimes we stay in there for a week big mistake uh elk are nomadic in that they'll find a feeding bedding pattern in a, a drainage I mean, two, two drainages away and do their thing and, and get established there uh, unless somebody else kicks them into the drainage you happen to be in. So that's kind of a luck thing. But uh, I'd say beating a dead horse, if uh, things aren't working for uh, well for you, move. Uh, it takes a lot of boot leather to be an elk, elk hunter. Um, other hunting tips, hard to say. I wouldn't change a thing. Um, the first year I went elk hunting, we spent 20 days under a backpack, me and my, my best buddy Paul, we didn't see an animal. We didn't even scare any. We didn't know how to find them. Started reading books on elk, you know, behavior and winter and summer grounds, things I didn't know about. We didn't have the internet in those days. And started to look in better places. Uh, second year, we, we got to scare a lot of animals. Uh, we just adding to the experience level. Uh, I can't remember if it was the third or fourth year, my buddy called the, my first bull elk in with a call that he made out of a pattern from Outdoor Life magazine that was made out of a garden hose. <laughs> and in those days that worked and probably would work today in certain circumstances. But no, I, I, I wouldn't really change a lot. Um, experiences I had over the years, all the mistakes, every, every bit of what I've, what I've done has been worth it. And, and I earn, you know, people that, that get out there and, and get out there in the woods, you're learning so much every day. Even on slow days, there's just so much to see and learn. Wouldn't, wouldn't change much at all. Uh, best piece of hunting gear under $10. I'm glad I got a preview on this. It took me about a minute to think of this though. Under 10 bucks. Let me grab Tommy's bow here. Under 10 bucks. If you want the handiest piece of gear under 10 bucks. It's like $12. Oh, it's be 12 bucks. Oh, on sale, it's, a, it's it's 10. It's this little dude right here. I don't know if you can see what I'm talking about. What's that thing? What's the official it's name of this? Holder. It's That's an arrow holder. arrow holder. It's a quick lock arrow holder. There's many varieties of this. They've made really cool ones in the old days. And all this little dude does is that if you're in a tree stand, but I, man, I've used it leaning my bow up against a tree when I'm elk hunting. We just clip this little dude on here. And that. Well, I don't have it clipped on very well. You want to do that for me, Tommy? I have my glasses on. Sure. <laughs> that baby keeps your arrow in place. Let's get it up closer to these other cameras, too. Pointing this bar broadhead at Tommy about slicing his nose off there. And this thing is really cool. So if you're in a tree stand and you know the wind comes up, and I can't tell you how many arrows I've dropped out of trees because I didn't have one of these on my bow, and I was cussing. But that is the handiest thing because this arrow stays in place no matter what's going on. But when you're getting ready to take your shot, I'll move over a little bit and we pull this arrow a little bit, this baby will, yep, let's put, turn it this way. We start drawing that bow, 
Can we see it in all cameras? This baby flips right off, all right? So I didn't have a good hook on this or anything, but then we're ready to roll. All right, you spook the deer away, he walks off, clip this baby back on, you're ready to roll again. So I'm glad Tommy had his bow here with one of these on it so we could actually show somebody. But that's one of the handiest little pieces of gear and it's about 10 bucks that you could have. All right, next question. All right, what do we got? All right, Ryan sent a series of questions from the different chapters in solid archery mechanics. So I'm gonna pick a couple of these and then we'll go to another one and then we'll come back to these just to work in some other shorter questions because I gotcha. think a lot of these are gonna be longer. Okay. So um, first one, does the finger pressure change for three undershooters? I seem to get better results with more pressure and deeper hook on the pointer finger. Okay. No, whether you're split finger or three under, the placement of your fingers and the pressure we're distributing between those fingers stays the same. It may feel like you're getting, uh, like you have a more, a bigger element of control by going deeper on the top finger, but let's review hook a little bit. Um, these two fingers on the end are subject to finger pinch. That's where the string makes a triangle around them. The top one and the bottom one are subject to finger pinch. That middle one, when we distribute the weight correctly, is carrying about half the weight of the, of the string. This bottom one, 10%. This top one, 40%. It's, these two guys are doing all the work. But this top one, he's on, he's on the end here where there's a bunch of finger pinch, right? But we got to get him off the string cleanly. So that's why we put that top one just in front of that joint but behind the finger pad. Because he needs to get off of this string. He needs to get off this string smoothly. Now, he's also adding protection to the middle guy because he's taking pinch off the middle guy who's doing half the work, right? Bottom guy, he's there for basically two reasons. He's there to keep your hand flat so we have a consistent angle with the bowstring, and he's there to take the, the pinch off the middle guy. So we don't want much pressure on him. So if you set a hook correctly, we're gonna get, we're gonna end up with a bit bit of a stair-stepping effect with low to middle to high with this with yeah get me in here where I need to be now, I don't know if we can catch a f angle on this um, let's try this here maybe get down on this a little bit all right square this up a bit but if you look at the way the finger joints align look at that top joint it aligns behind the the middle guy and then this, this one here is going to be just a floater. So, but when we get pressure on this string, we're going to get a stair-stepping effect. Can you see that at all, Steve, with that camera angle? But anyway, when we start our draw, it's naturally going to put a little bit of extra pressure on that top guy. By the time we get into most, most way into our draw, that pressure is going to kind of distribute itself between those top two. This bottom guy is there to take the pinch off of the middle guy who's doing most of the work, and it's there to keep my hand flat with the string. If I've got a big bite on that top finger, it's really hard to keep a string angle straight, so you probably see some torque there, right? If I got my string aligned, we should have a pretty straight string there. If I let this pinky ride out, I'm naturally going to get some torque. Look at the bend in the string now. Look at the bend in the string now, if you can see that. Whereas if I can tuck this pinky in, maintain that hook, I'm going to keep a fairly straight string, what that probably should be. So that top finger being deeper probably feels great. It probably feels like you have a lot of control. But we've done some high-speed camera shots with a deep top finger. And what you'll also notice is these fingers can't come out together. That string doesn't blow through your fingers all at the same time. What you're going to get is a blink, 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 you know, and you're not going to get a smooth release. He's subject to pinch, and if you've got a deep hook, it, the string can't get through that finger very smoothly. So even though it feels better for now, trust me for a bit, hang in there. Alex went through this with us, shot a super deep top finger. I, I said, Alex, got to try this, got him out here, 
at first his group changed and he said this sucks and he kind of went away from it and I kind of harped on him and then uh, we went through it again and I got him to try it again and, he's, and he finally got his distribution well and took some pressure off this bottom finger and all of a sudden his releases are breaking awesome. What really convinced him is when we shot high speed film of me and Jerry shooting and our fingers would just come cleanly through the string like this and then we shot Alex and they were like bink 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 I mean it was ridiculous how the string was coming through the fingers on different timing got him up there towards just a touch in front of the joint but behind the pad and all of a sudden we film him and they're coming through clean his groups cleaned up and now he's a big proponent and preaches it as much as I do so hang in there I would really try not to shoot that that deeper hook although you feel a little more secure a little more control but doesn't work as good overall all right, next one. Yep. Oh, real quick, I got a question for you. Yeah, Tom. follow up. Uh, Nash Sanders from Maui asks, when are you going to come out to do lessons again? In Maui? <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been talking to Ryan Sanpei, and uh, I don't know what island Nash is on or some of the other folks, but we're really talking about a year from April going out there. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be big fun. I'd love to. <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, Drew asked on Instagram, and we have another question from uh, a guy. Another question from Instagram about kids. So I'm going to throw this one in there. Okay. Drew asks, "How do you keep the fire?" He's got two young boys. Yeah. How do you keep the fire in your young kids? And then Mark also asks, "I'm getting my three and four year old kids their first recurve bow for Christmas. Mm -hmm. What's your best instruction for little kids?" So I figured you could tackle those both at the same time. Okay. I'm going to let you chip on chip in also, Tommy, because you've just been through this, right? And you bit too, Steve. Yep. So my philosophy with little kids is keep it simple and keep it fun. Keep it short. Their attention spans are narrow. Don't let them, you know, it's kind of like training a bird dog, you know, like you got to pull the retriever away before the, they're kind of ready to quit. So I keep my sessions fairly short and also keep the instruction fairly simple, especially for that, those real young ones, three and four. Uh, kids are ready at different ages. I noticed my oldest grandson met three and a half. This little dude had a back quiver. He could load his own arrow, stand around the line with his and shoot his bows. His younger brother is going to be a little older. Different personalities, different nature of the kids. Um, get him to the side of the cheek. Put your hands on the kid. Uh, don't do as much verbal instruction as literally physically changing them to where you want them to be. Um, those are some general tips. Lots of pop cans and balloons. <laughs> Uh, anything else you'd add to that, Tommy, with the experience with your kids now? No, because my kids were pretty, at first, especially my older, was pretty naturally on fire. For it? I hope to keep yeah. that fire. Um, I've taken yeah. him hunting a couple times, hoping that we could do some actual hunting, but he wasn't, he couldn't sit for very long, and he couldn't take the cold weather. So yeah. this year, yeah. where we were turkey hunting, it was it was really cold. I carried three or three blankets into the blind I carried a little heater made sure that they were comfortable nice um, and you know for three hours they sat there and did great and then we had four toms just thunder in gobbling 10 yards from the blind so it paid off it, I'm glad that we had that experience but nice. just keeping them comfortable I'm I my oldest is eight so I'm by no means an expert but I hope do you remember anything from our experience that that I did that helped you ever um, analyze that at all or think about it There's probably some stuff that you did that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. But Danny and I, never, we always had the fire from day one till now. Yeah. So if you did something, it was probably unbeknownst to us. Yeah. There were some things. That, you know, when I did stuff with these boys, I wanted them to be my hunt partners, man. And so I was really conscious of them having a good time. If we went fishing and they wanted to throw rocks in the lake, have at it, have fun. Uh, I take them a little rabbit excursions. We kept them short. I made really sure they didn't get too cold, too hot, too tired, and I usually yanked them out before they really wanted to quit. And I wanted to keep that fire alive. But uh, I just can't emphasize this: keep it fun for the kid and keep it short. Keep the fire alive. That's my main advice. And keep it simple. We just need to get them to the cheek and have some fun. What kid doesn't like to watch an arrow fly? It's pretty easy. What's that, Ben? Don't bang the table. Oh, Shake okay, down. got you. Got All right, it. let's go back to a technical question. Okay. Um, I'm struggling with a high wrist. I'm currently using a solid hook, but when I add the high wrist, it seems to add tension in my forearm and when I load. It almost loads right into my holding position instead of coming to anchor, then transfer to load. Uh, as of now, my hook is solid, but my wrist is relaxed. Okay. 
Um, I understand what you're saying about holding the bucket, but if I was to do a bent over row with the bucket and squeeze my back, it's more comfortable for me to use a relaxed or neutral wrist. Okay. So you're struggling with a high wrist, it's more comfortable yeah. with a relaxed wrist. Gotcha. A couple things might be happening. Um, number one, you might be emphasizing it too much. I mean, that high wrist is not a big angle. It's not a big angle, it's a very natural angle. The other thing that will cause great discomfort is if you draw the bow from where the arrow's pointing at the bullseye and straight back. You cannot help but bend the wrist as it comes back. It's gotta be drawn from a position a little bit out from your body, straight into this area of your anchor point. Um, if you're shooting, a, if you've got a fairly flat wrist, it's gonna be pretty good position. If that wrist is bent outward, remember that that inward bending wrist pushes the shoulder out, you know, the angle from the wrist to the shoulder is this way, whereas the angle changes We'll put this on the side. So if we have an outward bending wrist, we're going to get much deeper into our back. Uh, so it's it's a li it's a bit of an improvement from a straight wrist to an angled wrist to get into your back deeper. So um, if you're feeling strain, I mean, anytime you're feeling pain, strain, uh, a lot of discomfort in your shot, something's wrong. And since we shoot a lot of arrows, we're going to lead to a repetitive motion injury sooner or later. So. If you're doing anything with an archery shot uh, that's causing pain and discomfort, stop. Um, what most people find is that the, the high wrist improves their holding position so much they see the, an immediate benefit. If you've got great comfort and, and really good alignment with a fairly straight wrist and relaxed wrist, I'm not opposed to you know, you not forcing it into a high wrist. Um, but like I said, it could be just because you're drawing the bow too far in a straight line this way from instead of drawing the bow from a bit outside to in. If you get this wrist inside on a straight line with the arrow pointing at the bullseye, you can't maintain that wrist, and that would cause a heck of a lot of strain. The only way it can be maintained is to keep it out away from you and then get it in here. Bam. So I don't know how much more I can go on, on that. Yeah, I um, think that sounds good. Okay. We, All right. we have a lot of questions coming in from Facebook and Instagram. Uh, okay. If we don't get to them, we will package those questions yeah, we'll up save and make questions. sure we get to them. Well. Absolutely. Right. I'm marking down what I get. Here's one from Instagram. I'm going to read this one because I get so many emails about the same, the same kind of question. Okay. Every day, dozens of emails. Um, Ryan says, I want to switch to the Day 6 Arrow, but I'm unsure which spine to buy. I'm currently using 400 spine axis with 275 grains up front, mm -hmm. should I just go with 400s again? Yeah, because the axis in the day six, if I'm not mistaken, are same diameter. Yeah, and arrows. so I read that so you could speak on on diameter. Right. Because that's really the only thing we have to go on. It's it's not like, if we don't know how that arrow is shooting or what it's doing, the only thing that we have to go on with this question is diameter. Right. If they're the same spine, so you're holding that constant. Right. And you're holding point weight constant. Right. The only other factor then... And length constant. And length constant, then the only other factor would be diameter. Correct. Speak on that for a minute. So diameter, bigger diameter, is just going to push the arrow point out away from your riser. So basically when you have a narrow diameter arrow, it's, it's in towards the string more. And so you, chances are you're going to have to use a bit stiffer of an arrow when we go narrower diameter or a little weaker arrow with the bigger diameter, weaker spine, weaker deflections. So you, it should be darn similar. It should be darn similar. Now, I don't know how they're measured, if it's true 400 on, on, the, on the dead nuts deflection. Which would make a difference. Which would make a difference. One might be a, a 386 and one's a 415 and they're, and they're calling it a 400. That could make a difference. So yeah, I'd bear shaft tune, but it should be, should be in range to where you could buy the same arrow. And then bear shaft tune it and make sure. Right. So you're saying yeah. I'm shooting a 5 16 carbon. I'm switching to a skinny shaft like a 17 64ths. Right. I need to go to a Might have to spine. bump up a spine group. Yeah. Might have to. I have, found that, I have found that to be true most of the time. Most of the time. And it really, it's weird. I don't know what, what the physics involved are, but... You know, we always usually, usually speak in generalities because, damn, if you don't find the exception sometimes, and, and that we can't even just explain the dynamics of why that exception happened, but um, could be in the way the guy shoots the bow or the torque he's got in the bow. Some, there's some other factors that can play in. So, in general, I think you're going to be good. So, and off that, I'll read another question from Instagram. Instagram here: When setting up a new bow and arrow combination, what is your tuning process? Also, do you bear shaft, paper tune, or something else? That's another. Super, super common question every mm -hmm. day. 
we get phone phone calls and emails about that. Okay. Same thing. We get folks in here and we're setting up an arrow for them. Um, if they've got a consistent shot, it, we're going to bear shaft tune. Uh, if they're setting up a hunting arrow, we're going to bear shaft tune. Uh, a lot of brand new shooters, there's things going to be changing in their form all the time. We're going to visually look at several, you know, we're going to estimate the target arrow that should work for them. We're going to get a full length one and we're going to shoot them and we're going to watch them. Um, they haven't built any consistent in their, consistency in their form, so we're really not going to spend the time. Anybody that's shooting a, uh, an arrow that, to go hunting with and it's got some s consistent form, we're going to bear shaft tune. We want, you know, we've, this is a higher level of responsibility that we're going to go after. And that usually leads to an archery lesson if they're squeezing the bow too tight or got problems here. It usually leads to an archery lesson anyway, so we can build some consistency. And, and we, because bear shaft tuning will expose other problems in their form. But anyway, that's, that's does that answer that? I think so, yeah. Okay. All right, we got three nose questions. <laughs> here they come. R. Doyle wants to know, why does the string occasionally hit my nose upon release? I'm just going to read them all. Yep. Um, Richard Stevens wants to know, when anchoring with the tip of my nose touching the back of the fletching, mm -hmm. how does the tip of my nose get hit by the string when I release the arrow? Same question. Okay. And then Ty Graham 127 she's asking, does that clumb beak help with your anchor point? <laughs> I think she's Ty talking about Ty Graham? Nose. I think she is my nephew. I'm going <laughs> to whack that kid next time I see him, but that's okay. <laughs> so how do you keep your nose out of the way of the string? Okay, most, most of the time, it, you know, there's... <laughs> First of all, let's talk about a common problem that people do, especially when trying to trigger a shot. As a lot of times, you know, when we're talking back tension, we're talking about scapular position against the spine. It sets the depth of your anchor, and we're just increasing tension against that wall there. There's no more movement to be had. We, we're increasing tension against that wall, and when the shot breaks, that thing moves through to its finished position. If a guy does what is hugely common, I've made the mistake myself, adds a little shoulder pull to the equation, you're going to pull that string around the face a little more and you're going to get a string or a nose slap. That's the way it is. Um, there's some bare bow shooters who use a vertical bow and a string blur and they can't keep the nose out of the way with that setup so they tape their nose. It's really easy for most of us with a side of the face anchor to put a little cant in the bow, tip the head a little bit with the bow and get that string just I mean, a sixteenth maybe away from your nose. So there's some simple cures. Most of the time, guys, it's a shoulder pull. It's a pull that from anchored position, you add tension, and all of a sudden you're dragging back a little bit. You've added a little bit of rear deltoid. You added a little shoulder pull. Instead of get, being against the wall with back tension, that anchor, no matter how much tension you add, is not going anywhere. When that shot breaks, the, it breaks right from that position, bam, and then this thing slides through to finish. So. I'll bet you it's a shoulder pull. It's the most common reason for face and nose scrapes. So it's a form issue. And we could spend another 20 minutes on that, but we're not. But back tension is direction tension that way, not in the direction your elbow is pointing. Okay. All right, next one. Um, as an instinctive shooter, is it okay to look at the target the entire time? I know you mentioned aiming after transfer to hold. Mm -hmm. So could I look at the spot continuously, yes. then focus, refine, after hold, then expand? Yes. Yes. I think it's highly advisable, right at set position, before you raise the bow up, to be looking at the focal point, focal point being the bullseye or the spot you want to hit. We need to be looking at that the whole time. So at this position, like set position and wait and see what's popping there. We're on the target line. I'm looking at the bullseye, but I'm not aiming. I get up here in the setup. I'm looking at the target, but I'm not aiming. I get into draw to load, to anchor, to transfer. I'm looking at the tar target, but I'm not aiming. There's just a point in time that you're going to confirm your aim. You're going to confirm your sight picture. You're going to confirm your gap, whatever you're looking at. As an instinctive aimer, there's a time where I go there, where I know it's on there. It's time to get into expansion to release and follow through. Got one question from Facebook. Uh, Drew Ware asked, I missed the beginning, will this be posted afterwards? Yes, we are going to post this. If you've missed any of this uh, broadcast, we'll be posting it on YouTube um, within the next few days, so stay tuned for that. Okay, but anyway, yes, we, I'm gonna go back to that because it's really important. When we aim, at, when we're in the transfer hold and supposed to aim we're just confirming the aim because you got to let it go you got to let the aim go to the subconscious 
the aim and the release of the arrow have to be subconscious. That's a pretty deep subject, but yes, we're just confirming aim. We're letting aim go. We're just looking at it. Joel says, watch it to keep it. I love his words. And then we're cognitively moving into tension in the right direction to the follow through position. Right. Okay. Um, the next one is from Mountain Element. He has two questions, but the second part of his question is going to lead into another one. So I'm just going to ask you the first part right okay. now. Is there a diagnosis of shooting structure position for shooting high left or right and low or left or right? Okay. What, what, explain, yeah. and I know what he's asking, but go ahead and explain what the most common causes are for of high, some of low stuff. misses and yep. left, right misses. Okay. So I'm going to talk about inconsistent misses first. You know, so if I, so let's talk about reading the target, Okay. If I have a right side miss, I can replay that shot, and I'm telling you, every single time, <clears throat> I lost tension before release. If I got a little cognitive of my release, and I think about releasing instead of thinking about the finished position, I'm going to lose a bit of tension. And what happens when I lose a little bit of tension here, you're going to lose a little alignment here. I'm telling you, a miss this far at 20 yards to the right is this much collapse on the front arm that happens when we misalign the backside, the front side comes out of a little alignment and caves in Point your for right the handed for a right handed eyes. shooter, it's always gonna go to the right, vice versa to the left. So if I lose a little tension here, I'm gonna lose a little alignment here. I'm exaggerating by fifty times that. Because a loss in tension for a back tension shooter looks like this. It, you know, if I did it in slow motion you'd see you'd be in here aiming and you'd see this little dip in your elbow, beep, like this, and then it would follow through. That's loss in tension. That's cognitive release. That's not keeping tension in the right direction to finish position. So anytime that elbow dips a little bit, and it's really hard if you're not used to watching for it, you can pick it up on your camera, play it back slow. If you see a little cave in here, there's a little cave in in the front side. It's going to be a right side miss. So right misses are most common most because Most commonly collapse. because of a collapse or yep. loss in tension, yep. which loss in tension is the biggest reason we all miss, from beginners to Olympians, right? So that's usually misses? loss. Left misses, you know, I heard, you know, some people, they always talk about squeezing the shoulder blade together. <laughs> if you're squeezing the shoulder blade together, it's going to pull your left arm. It's going to pull your left arm away. That left arm going away, by the way, is a natural result of expansion after the arrow's off the bow. But if that is happening at all because you're increasing tension in the wrong way, you're going to yank it off to the left. It could be bow torque. It could be a hand squeeze that's linked to the bow going off. A little pressure. Pardon me? Shaking the table again. Okay. So um, a left miss could be a pluck where your hand flies away, you know, your shoulder pulling or whatever. And instead of its linear release, the hand flies away. Sometimes they get off the string and they go down the middle, but sometimes you drag that knock out to the right a little bit, causing a left side miss. If I get a little tension in my hand, this is a diagnosis for me personally, I've learned this through experience. If I start getting a little squeeze in there with the release, a little link brace, so to speak, I lift that shot up to the left. That's a high left miss for me. I know where it comes from. Sometimes if I haven't set my shoulder down and I get a little drift here, that's going to cause a high, high, high miss. Now those are intermittent misses. You know, if I've got a consistent left miss, I pretty know, much know I'm not getting my head tipped so I get alignment of my eye over the arrow. That's a consistent left miss. And so it's usually a head position, you're like your rear sight alignment. Um, that's that's a consistent left miss uh, or a consistent right miss. It's usually an alignment issue with, with eye to arrow situations going on. There's stuff to look for for that. But I'm talking about intermittent misses. So yes, we read the target. We also want to learn our shot well enough to know if I miss here, it's usually this. You replay the shot in your mind. Yep, that's what I'm doing. You've identified the problem. Now what's the correction to that? If I've got loss in tension, my correction is I've got to keep tension focused at the finish position through the whole shot. There's my correction. I focus on the correction. Forget about the mistake. Focus on the correction. Um, hard to go deeper into this kind of stuff from there, but does that kind of answer the question yeah, in your then, mind? Yeah, um, and then address up-down misses because they're so common for beginning archers. Yeah, so, you know, let me tell you something about the, the, the subconscious and the human mind. Um, subconscious, you know, always 
multiplies power. It involves, it grabs all the muscle groups it can to do any task at hand. If we're lifting something with our arms, we generally add the shoulder squeeze, the upper trapeze, we generally enhance it like this. If we're pulling on something, we generally lean back to help the pull, right? And so, especially for new archers, and if we're really focusing on maybe a back tension release, man, we'll enhance it a little bit. We'll pull those shots right up out of there. And a lot of times at first when we're we're learning to, to make a subconscious release by driving through in a quick motion to get these uh, to release without thinking about them. We'll add a little head and, and torso lift. Uh, sometimes it's a link brace. It's your body's reaction to the bow going off. Um, and it's timed in such a way. When, when we know when the bow's going off, generally there's a little tightening somewhere in our body. We call it link bracing. Joel talks about it a ton and how to cure that, how to get away from it in the shot IQ Q videos. But uh, yeah, there's uh, high, low misses or a lot of that. Lows are usually a collapse too. Sometimes I'll collapse and just get a low miss, but usually my collapses or my loss intentions are right and right to the, and low right, especially because we're not shooting with power. So it's low and it's a collapse. So it's right, right and low is, all, is, ver is always a, a collapse. All right. Cool. So the second part of his question, I'm going to read, and then I'm going to go into Joe Har's question as well. Okay. Um, and they're both loaded questions, so we'll just have to do, give, do the best you can. With what we got to work um, with. He also wants to know, in choosing a bow, how do you really know it's a fit for the shooter? So we can address that. But okay. Joe Har wants to know, for a beginner just getting into trad, coming from compounds, mm -hmm. it's apparent that arrow selection and tuning have a much narrower window of compatibility compared to compounds where you can just go stiffer and as mm -hmm. long as your bow is tuned you're fine. So how does a beginner differentiate between form issues, tuning issues, and arrow flight or spine issues? I True. thought I should have read those closer, they're not related at all. No, they aren't. <laughs> and you're right, a beginning archer is not going to know what is form issues, arrow issues. <laughs> you know, basically they're not. Let's go to that first question, how do you pick the right bow? How do you know if it's a fit for the shooter? Right. Okay, so um, Let's just talk about bow weight, biggest issue there is. Um, particularly when you're a beginner, um, we want a bow that's too light, not too heavy. I'd, if you're br learning a brand new shot, we want a, we want a bow that's going to feel like more like a toy. Um, but in any case, a bow that's right for you is one that is comfortable to draw, where we're not straining. It's no fun to be straining against the weight of a bow where you can put your body into correct positions. You can fully get your shoulder girdle back. You can get to the load, get to that full position. You can get into anchor. You can transfer all. You can make all these movements exactly correctly, slowly, so you can train them. You can cognitively run them correctly. You can't do that if the bow's too heavy. So we're in the, in the learning phase, especially in the learning phase where everything's got to be cognate and slow and directed. We've got to have a lighter bow, all right? And then, um, the disqualifier even as a hunting bow is can we get into all of our positions comfortably? Can we execute all the movements com comfortably? Um, if you're over bowed, you physically can't do those things. And the difference in good form might be the difference between being here and here. And that's a small difference to the people who don't know a lot about shooting yet. So, you know, those things are big deals when you're learning because remember, we're imprinting anything you do as a as an imprinted motor program in your brain, we're imprinting a whole neural pathway to the movements of the muscles that contract and expand. So it's really important that we do those shots correctly. And if we're overboat, we can't even get close to the positions to make those, get into those positions and make those movements correctly. So whatever that heaviest bow where you can comfortably get into proper shooting positions and comfortably make the movements and accurately make the movements is the bow for you. If you go two pounds over that, you won't be able to make those accurately, and you're making yourself worse every shot. Uh, was the other part of that? So if we like, could sum that up saying that you know it's a good fit for you if you could execute proper form. Form. Yes. Okay. And, and, and draw the bow comfortably. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, and do you want to go into how a beginner differentiates between form, tuning, and arrow flight issues? Too much, too much to learn there. Um, you know, if you don't have a shot that's consistent, you can't dial so in arrow flight issues. So how do you issues. learn that? Time? Experience? Uh, yeah, just consistency in shot execution will tell you about 
uh, arrow tuning issues. So as you get more consistent in your shooting, you'll start seeing consistent results. Well, then we can tune it and then an you arrow. Can start to narrow right. down. Yes. The culprit. Absolutely. If uh, if you don't have a consistency for it, even if it's bad form, if it's consistent, you can get fairly good. But we can't get consistent arrow flight with with inconsistent ways in which we execute shot or deeper shots or weaker shots or there's too too much to go into it. Uh, and don't worry too much about it at that phase. You need to learn to shoot the bow first. It's probably the main thing we'll be concerned about. All right. Here's a non non shooting form question. Okay. Is Danny the luckiest bow hunter in the Clum family? <laughs> yes. I got a yes from the gallery. <laughs> I would say no. Yes. <laughs> We've got a little competition here. I would say, and you, it'd be hard to deny, he's the hardest working bow hunter in the family. He puts in the time. He he works on all aspects of the game. He does the most scouting. He's in the woods more. Uh, but he's not had kids like you have. He's also the luckiest. He's pretty freaking lucky sometimes. But man, Dan, he Dan pretty is, much earn, earns his luck, dude. He, he is a hard working son of a I gun. I would never deny that. <laughs> Dan is the most... He's the most generous in the Clum family. He'll he, always say, I'll choose the stand last. He always lets everyone else choose first. And the deer always walk by him anyways. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that's So could both be, things are true. That could be some gamesmanship, too. You know, that stand over on the south side is really freaking good. But you can have that one. He learned that from his cousin, Chad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is my best stand. You go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the next one. Um, with accuracy from full control and solid practice being paramount for hunting, what would you say about draw weight hunting for elk hunting? Mm -hmm. If someone was deadly accurate with their setup, what would you say should be their minimum draw weight for elk? Okay. Lots of opinions on that one. I would basically go to the, not the minimum, I would go to the highest weight you can shoot with that accuracy and precision, period. What if it's only 35 pounds? Uh, then we're going to have to do a little work in the strength. Yeah. So, um, you're, so you do have a minimum. I kind of do. It's uh, higher than 35. Yes, with a traditional bow. It depends on your draw length, too. Yep. If a guy's shooting a 35-pound bow with a 32-inch draw, it's a pretty fast arrow. Uh, inch of draw length is worth about 6 to 10 pounds of bow weight. We can prove it on a chronograph. All, things, all other things being equal. Um... I guess, you know, this is uh, going to be one of those things where uh, people have different opinions, like belly buttons. I'm going to go with low 40s as a raw minimum. The gallery, shaking his head yes. Tommy? From the feedback I've got on customers, I, I only know of one customer in all these years that's killed an elk with a bow around 35 pounds. Okay. And it was a young kid, and he shot a calf, and it was a close shot. Okay. But it was an elk. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with yeah. low forties. But now we got arrow and broadhead considerations. We better have some weight. We better have some weight for. We better have a cut on contact broadhead. I mean, which is probably more important. Yeah, with perfect arrow flight. Yeah. Um, there's some other considerations to be met, made there. And and before our day, there was a lot of people killing a lot of elk with 42, 45 pound bows. And you got to remember, a 35 pound bow. If that arrow happens to hit right between the ribs, it's gonna go through both lungs. If, you, if that 35-pound bow happens to center punch a rib, meh, the rib rebounds a little bit, uh, might get one long, could be tough. So there's some luck involved in that, too. I will say this, as a bow hunter, most arrows deflect off or go between the ribs. Right. And that enhances penetration a so, lot. But wait, that's a hard question to answer. Super tough question. Because there are question. more factors than just bow weight. Look at Wayne it's Depperschmidt. Arrow setup, it's shot his moose, shot right through a moose a few years ago, 76 years old, the shooting bow. a... 45-ish pound bow shot through both sides of a moose. Was with, it even 45? Uh, my, I don't know. I don't remember the exact number. Yeah. It was a fairly light But there's bow. more factors than just More bow factors weight. Yeah. than bow weight. That's a good question. Definitely. All right, here comes a couple clicker Most questions. Most way you can shoot well, whatever the heck that is. Okay. Here's a couple clicker questions. Okay. Um, these are long, so I'm going to... We'll work through them. All right. Give me short and, answers. Okay. <laughs> I know you mentioned that only unicorns can shoot without a clicker. I guess my question is... If you're in the expansion phase and your shot just breaks, can that be a surprise release? I feel that when I use a compound trigger, I'm definitely commanding the shot, but with a stick bow and fingers, when I'm expanding correctly, it seems to just go. 
Sometimes it's hard to get the clicker at the perfect length, and if it's not just right, it becomes a distraction. Yep, he's right about all those things. I think he's right about all those things. I find that in my shooting, as long as I'm into tension, there's a moment where your brain says, yeah, is right freaking perfect as an instinctive aimer, where as long as I'm into the con expansion movement or into in subtly increasing tension, I usually make great shots without length braces. And I think if that's not a command, <laughs> it can be a pretty much act like a surprise where you don't have a lot of link bracing. Um, I don't know what Joel has to say that, maybe he completely disagrees, but for me, I'm telling you, that's my best, most accurate shots, which tells me I don't have a lot of link bracing going on. All right, here is uh, Jethro Traffy. Oh, let me add one thing to that. Go ahead. If I'm not into that controlled movement where I've confirmed my aim, said, yep, right there, and don't move into tension, all kinds of bad things happen. We're talking about this guy releasing the arrow in the expansion phase, in the phase where you're subtly increasing tension to a clean break. And that break usually is when your mind confirms yes. What happens though is we tend to shortcut that, or the subconscious shortcuts that from getting into tension to that clean break to almost just starting tension to the clean break and we're gonna get into the tension but the break happens and all kinds of bad stuff happens. But yes, if you're clearly into a second or two of increasing subtle precision tension to a break, it can work really exceptionally well. All right, so here's another question. I'm going to go through the background that he gives for this question mm -hmm. because this is also another very common thing that customers ask about all the time. Very common background story. So Jethro Traffy says... Um, I would like to know the process behind clickers. I've been shooting traditional for about four years now. Uh, two years ago, two months before his season, he was shooting the best he'd ever shot. Huge amounts of confidence in my shot process. I was fortunate enough to attend a class put on by Joel Turner. He insisted that I put a clicker on, and subsequently both my accuracy and consistency in my shot went to garbage. I found that it increased all kinds of anxiety and made my focus change from executing my shot to focusing on the clicker only. That's a, the most common clicker story that we hear. Would you yep. agree? And he, so do you want me to read the rest of it? Oh, I got the answer right now. He said it himself. I'll, yeah, he I'll did read say it. it. Yes, he said his problem right within ahead, his sentence. First. Okay. <clears throat> he didn't pick this up in Joel's seminar because I trust me, Joel went over this and it's easy to miss in one the seminar. Because in Joel's seminar, you were learning so much. It's like drinking from a fire hose. So this is, this is easy but this has to be highlighted again. And it's the most common thing folks do when they shoot with a clicker, Let isn't me, it? Uh, or one of them? Oh, yeah. I mean, but he said it himself. Let me find it here. It's underlined right there. Okay. All kinds of anxiety. And made my focus change from executing my shot to focusing on the clicker. There's the problem. You quit focusing on executing your shot and started focusing on the clicker. That is so common. I've done it myself. I'm not criticizing. How do you get over it? <laughs> You have to, and coin a lot of what Joel says, I use a lot of what Joel says because it's really good ways to put this, you have to make a darn decision to focus on what at the end of your shot? In the expansion phase, you have to focus on the same things you were doing when you were shooting great. The movement. You have to focus on subtly increasing tension to that break and to the finish position. If your mind goes to that clicker, you're going to react to the clicker. You're think, you, how can you, your conscious mind can focus on one thing at a time, just one. If you're focusing on that clicker, probably you're not making a real consistent movement to get the clicker to click, right? Because you're thinking, you're listening for it instead of focused on what you should be, which is correct archery form, which is increasing tension in the right direction, aimed at the finish position, and simply that. Simply looking at your target, letting the subconscious handle the aim, right? And driving tension in the right direction in a subtle increasing manner till the click clicks or doesn't click. If it doesn't click, you don't get to shoot. If it clicks, we let go. Now, here's what he's missing on this thing. So he says that he finds it extremely hard to concentrate on his holding aiming position and coinciding that with the clicker going off. Right. That's the so, same thing. He's you the same thing. Now, on. if he's focused on his holding, if the aiming, if he's focused on aim, his shot's going to go to hell. So right? where's the focus placed? The focus is on, at the end of the shot, you've confirmed your aim, you've let it go to the subconscious. 
you're focusing on tension in the right direction, or in most cases it's kind of like a transfer hold movement, this tension here where we have movement. I wouldn't call it true expansion for anybody but elite level because true expansion is an invisible movement. We have, a little, we have to have a little bit visible movement and tension of that driving the arm behind you. Leave some movement in there. Leave some movement in there to activate your clicker and focus on that movement. You're just watching your aim. The aim has to be let go. We're focused on the movement, the click happens, the release happens. So the intention of the clicker is to be a non-anticipatory release trigger. We can't anticipate it. If we're trying to build, if we're starting to time it, listen for it, the whole shot goes to hell. So if we're completely focused on the correct movement to the finish position, that's the way it runs. So as Joel says, here's the, use some of his terminology, he ha you've got to make a decision that you have to use your willpower, you have to direct your mind to a one lane road, man. You're going down one lane, and that lane is tension in the right direction. That's it. If you let, if you don't make a strong enough decision, you let the thought of that clicker come into your mind, you're gonna lose your shot because, first of all, the movement stops. You think about, is this thing gonna click? Is it not gonna click? Uh, it should be clicking by now and maybe you'll try to force a click and everything goes to hell. We've got a precision controlled cognitive movement that we just continue to focus on. We're going to drive it with words, use Joel's stuff. We're going to go, 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 go. And if this thing goes too long, it's time to let down. If this thing is timing out, the intensity of that movement gets you click to go, but click between two and three seconds from when you've confirmed your aim, your money. You've got to let You've got to stay on that clicker long enough with a focus on tension in the right direction until the release, the subconscious release, happens as, a, as it gets linked to the click, in other words. There's two things in your shot that have to be subconscious. I'm going to talk fast here. The aim has to be subconscious, and the release has to be subconscious. And, man, this is a deep subject, and that's why I've got a five-hour video that dives deep into all this stuff. There's too much uh, to go into here, but if your aim doesn't turn subconscious and if this release doesn't get conscious and linked to the touch or the click, then we're using it incorrectly. There's different ways to use a clicker. Some people use it as a draw check. Click, okay, I'm here. Now they increase tension to the finished position, they can develop a good shot that way. But if it's used correctly and you've shot it 20 to 50 times, usually it takes for the subconscious release to just link to the click that you're not waiting for, all right, when that truly gets linked to a click and you're just focused on tension in the right direction, what happens is that click happens, the release happens subconsciously, and now there's no reaction to the bow going off coming from your subconscious, the shot breaks clean, it goes on the trajectory path you've already set without influence, and it's your perfect shot. That's what Olympic Olympians do all the time with their clickers. That's why they shoot every shot in practice, every shot in competition with a clicker. You know the arrow's going off at the same draw length every time. So yes, if you're thinking incorrectly, and if you're focusing on the clicker, it ain't going to work. Matt Dierker says, if you've not touched on it yet, please uh, touch on the transfer to hold to expansion and where I should be feeling the building of the tension. Thanks again. Okay. Repeat that question just to make sure they all heard it. Um, if you no, had, you no. repeat it. Okay, so he's asking about um, transfer to hold and the feeling of tension. He wants to know where you should feel the tension. Where I should be feeling the building of tension. Where you should be feeling the building of tension. So, so once we draw to load, we anchor. The last movement is a small movement called transfer to hold. We're going to get the last bit of engagement of the scapula into the spine, last bit of back engagement through transfer to hold. And it, I think you can see that movement. It's straight along the line, straight behind me. Transfer to hold, okay? That gives me my, that gets all the powder in the gun, gives me full and back engagement. From that point, if it's true back tension, that, you're stuck there, man. It's like, I'm not gonna call that the wall. So any tension you build is just like pushing on a wall. You can build tension in your thighs as you're pushing against the wall, but there's no movement. That's the tension you should be feeling. That's the tension you should be building. That's the tension you should be building to the time where that release, the follow-through position comes. 
for anybody but an elite archer, we usually like to put the clicker or the feather touch inside that last transfer to hold movement. Expansion at the elite level is an invisible movement. That's why an Olympic archer, he's, he's only got a millimeter or two millimeters of movement to get to his clicker. And that's where he's got full shoulder alignment, all the powders in the gun for draw length from shoulder, shoulder hand alignment. And transfer to hold happens. He's got the scapula. We're dug into the back where it, with all the powders in the gun. Now he needs a millimeter or two of movement. That's a very, very precise movement. So think of 70 meters, 77 yards, 76.7 yards or whatever it is. It needs that kind of precision to be accurate that far. So it's an invisible movement. That invisible movement can and just as, as far as it happens from ex, literal expansion, the muscles are getting longer in the chest, the chest is opening up. There's also happen, happening something or something is happening internally where that scapula is making a final movement. It'll shift this whole structure forward a bit so that bow will kind of move into and through the clicker as opposed to the arrow moving through the clicker. So those are invisible. That's elite level shooting. That's true expansion. Virtually none of us can get to a limb mounted clicker to that accuracy when you're at holding position. So I like to have that thing where you go load, anchor, transfer, but that transfer is not a hard movement. I'd maybe like transfer to get a soft movement, set the direction, confirm your aim, just will look at your aim, and then continue that basically the transfer to hold movement. It's a small movement to activate your clicker or your feather touch. So we didn't, uh, you know, there's not a lot of chances to talk about this elsewhere, but basically that movement, you need to have some movement to activate that clicker. So the transfer to hold movement, which is about that much, is where we want to put that clicker in the middle of. So we're going to start subtle pressure. Now set the direction for your movement. Confirm your aim. Here we go. And just start driving that tension in the back of your arm behind you. And just keep focused on that movement until you get the click and the release happens and to follow through position. So since you're talking about expansion, I'm going to throw this in. Ryan asks during the expansion phase, when my shoulder blades sque uh, squeeze and touch, my bow arm moves slightly towards the target. Is that a bad thing? Yes. <clears throat> Oh, moves towards the target, straight towards the target. It just says my bow arm moves slightly towards the target. All right, is that he's a bad moving, thing? That's that that last movement that shifts the structure, shoulder, shoulder, hand forward. If it's going straight at the target, it's not a bad thing. It's kind of what true expansion actually does, but it's usually very invisible. So I think if he's pushing his his uh, if this hand shifts to the target, he's probably coiling that last little bit. He's probably getting that last little bit of shoulder alignment, which is a way that Joel teaches to get to that clicker when you're a little weak or tired. He calls it a full body movement. I don't prescribe that, but when you're weak and you need to get to that clicker, sometimes a little more coil in a precision manner can get you to do the clicker and make a good shot. I bet you that's what he's feeling. But you should already be coiled to the max shoulder shoulder hand alignment for the best, most precision shot and then activate through an isolated movement to the right side or the drawing side. If you're lefty, it's the left side. So that front shoulder blade is already set. It shouldn't be squeezing them together. That's going to pull your shot away. Front shoulder blade set with that low shoulder right off the get the right at setup position. Over here, it's an isolated movement. That right side is the one you're working tension against to get to the to the release. So as a guy who doesn't use a clicker right now, my tension is all maxed out. I'm just building tension against that wall to the release and follow through. But I never think release. I'm just thinking of the follow through position like and finish right so that tension any movement is invisible just like true expansion if I've got a clicker on then I'm going to leave a little movement here to get to my clicker all right and then I'm going to have a very controlled precise movement click to the finish position okay all right let's go with the non-form question just to switch things up a little bit this is a bow question I shoot a 64 inch long bow, 55 at 28, cut forward of center, and I'm getting wear on the edge of the shelf. Is it the cause, is it, is it because, sorry, I'm just reading it how it's written. Is it because my grip or the way I release, or is it my choice of arrow? This is getting shelf wear. <clears throat> now, I wonder if he's talking about shelf wear or side clip I'm wear. sure he's talking about this part right here, which would probably be the most common shelf wear, right? Right. It says on the edge of the shelf. So it's probably this edge yes. here. So I'm wondering if we've got knock position. 
Or spine, maybe? Spine, yeah. That arrow basically doesn't have much contact with the side plate. He asks if it's because of his grip or the way he releases. Could that be a cause? Yeah. If you're torquing the bow with grip, that could definitely cause some air abrasion issues. Remember, when you let go of the arrow, that second bend is coming around the shelf, basically. So you're not going to have a lot of side plate wax because literally the arrow is kind of bending around it. It needs to bend around it just enough to go straight. If it bends around too much, it's a weak arrow. Shoots off to the right for a right handed shooter. Now, a stiff arrow will cause a lot of side plate abrasion, maybe even up into here. The stiff arrow will bang off your riser this way, and you're, a lot of times you'll hear a clack. But a properly tuned arrow is going to just kind of just float around the riser and exit straight. All right, so if you've got wear on, on the rest itself, I mean, I've had knock issues where it's slamming the arrow down against into the shelf. Outside edge, tough call. We shouldn't get much wear on there if we've got the knock set correctly because it's just going to come straight around we're not maybe we've got like a knock set issue that's getting down under that edge so maybe we've got a normal spine but downward pressure on that arrow it's little process edge. of elimination is in in order yeah. to determine what's going on there definitely yep because it could I can't be, nail it down with that yeah it could be multiple factors yes it yep. could be. so so test them all see what helps yeah i tried knock adjustment first okay here's another question from ty cuppinger how does your grip change with a longbow versus a recurve? It does not. The grip is always on the thumb pad. It's always saddled up against that crack right there. Now, a longbow grip is going to be a low grip, so that hand is going to be all the way back here. That grip is going to be right along the lifeline. We're going to set that front finger on the bow, the, this, these, these fingers under. So my grip is going to, might look like, something like that with a recurve. And I'll get a longbow out because I think I've got one handy here, or at least a longbow handle. It's not strong, but that's okay. And the grip is going to look like this with a longbow. It's the same grip. It's the same pressure. It's the same pressure on the thumb pad right there with a relaxed wrist. Now, high wrist is going to, that pressure is going to change a little bit because your hand's going to be more at this angle instead of flat like this. But the, where the pressure point is and how you orient your hand are the same. Good, got it? Got it. All right, here's Flatlander in a Tall World asks, how do you combat target panic? Or in general, get your composure when it's time to let one fly. Sometimes my heart is about to burst out of my chest and I have a hard time getting back in the game. Okay, a long subject. You need uh, Joel's Shot IQ program. Um, that's a long subject. Uh, I'll tell you some things that generally lead into it right away that don't really go deep in. If you, that new archer, if he attaches the release of the arrow to the fact that he's aimed, he's already on his way to target panic. Subconscious will start doing it for you. A separation has got to be made from the fact that you're aimed into tension in the right direction to the follow through position. So anytime you're attaching a release immediately to the fact you're aimed, that's going to get more efficient. Your subconscious is going to make it quicker and quicker and quicker. Pretty soon it's going to be Instead of anchor, aim, and your release happens, pretty soon it's going to be anchor and aim and the release happens. Pretty soon anchor and your release, your aim looks good and it goes. Pretty soon you're almost at anchor and your mind says, yep, it's gone. And, you know, that's a, the most common thing is not separating the activation of the shot from the aim. That's all I'm going to touch on target panic for right now. As far as getting your stuff under control with an animal in front of you. I was going to say, yeah, that's fine and dandy on, a, on the target range. How yeah. about when an animal's standing in front of you? Yeah. Does that relate? Well, the confidence from knowing how to activate a great shot is going to reduce a yep. lot of mental tension right there. Yep. A great holding position, the mechanics of a great holding position is going to reduce a lot of physical tension, which is going to relieve mental tension. But most of all, we've got to get cognitive again because we get a little bit subconscious when all that stuff happens. And so Joel prescribes uh, combat breathing. He goes through it in his programs. He's a in four, hold four, out four, hold four, in four, four seconds during these processes. So I want, I want to chime in on this. Yep. I know I've heard you say the same thing, mm -hmm. but I remember the first shot that I took at an animal where I felt like I was in control, okay. and it was a result of getting control on the range. First. I remember the shot. It was at a turkey. I remember the blind I was sitting in nice. and the actual shot. Nice. And I've heard you say similar stuff. I've heard Joel say similar stuff. That was absolutely true for me. Flatlander asks, in general, how do you get your composure when it's time to let one fly? 
I really do think knowing that you are in control of your shot gives you a heck of a lot of confidence in the woods. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Knowing exactly how you're going to shoot your shot beforehand. Joel talks about blueprinting your shot, knowing exactly, I got to do this, 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 and this. And maybe it's two things for you, maybe it's six things for the other guy. But if I know I have to hit these middle mental benchmarks, you know, I got I to get here, and then here, and here, and here, and here. I, I have a blueprint to follow, and I focus on that, and I forget focusing on if I'm going to get the handle, if I'm not going to get the, if I just focus on my shot, it's, the results are going to be way better. If I focus on this process, if I do some breathing and get my heart rate down, I'm like, just a little bit, I'm going to be in more control. Just the act of breathing is going to get you thinking. you got to be cognitive. When you're cognitive, you're, oh, yeah, i got to run this shot correctly. i got to get it. And so you set up your shot and you start hitting your steps. Have a process. Have a way to concentrate. You know, there's much more in Joel's program on how to make this done under pressure. These are some highlights, you know, some things that we do as as uh, hunters that get our act together and do our business correctly. And here's another thing, nothing replaces have been in that experience numbers of times. Uh, so I'm always mo the most wigged out the first animal to I sure shoot at that during the year because it's been a it's been a spell. You know, and I get, to, you know, after the first one or two that I kind of screw up, I'm get, then I get more determined to get the shot done correctly, and they go more correctly. It's a determination factor. It's a determination to run this shot exactly this way, no matter what. On it. And as Joel says, it's a matter of trying to seek pressure outside of a hunting situation. Nothing can replicate an animal in front of you. But if you can go to tournaments, if you can shoot in a crowd of people do what's on if shooting in front of people is uncomfortable for you get in front of people and shoot and you're going to fail and learn to say get determined and concentrate through your shot and then have some success and then learn to do it act you know a lot you know learn to make it consistent and your confidence builds now elevate the amount of stress or distraction that you have from that hey if you got to if you you know you got to get a buddy like I'll bet you a beer I can make that shot or let's see who's gonna add competition add find a way to add some pressure to your shot outside of the uh, of the situation well JT will turn her toe tells me he'll walk up to a guy he's looking for a way to shoot under pressure walk up to a stranger in the rain there's a 60 yard up and he'll walk up to the guy and go hey watch this now he's just been like a Muhammad Ali claim he's got to make a good shot down that's pressure I what I do for pressure is when I'm teaching I shoot for my students now watch this. That's pressure to be. If I can't shoot well, eh, what kind of you know credibility do I have? That's pressure to me. So I always make sure I gather their attention and, and shoot in front of them. If I'm on the range with my buddies and I've got four four fives and I haven't got that fifth one, I stop. Hey, God, I got four in a row. Watch this fifth one. And it, that's pressure. Find a way to get pressure, guys, outside of a hunting environment. Nothing's going to replicate the real thing, but more experience with the real thing happening is going to help. But breathing is the first first key to it. That is a giant thing. Is get your get some deep breaths in and out. For me, it's a big in and out. Joel's four in, hold four, four out, hold four. That's a great way to do it too. Flaherty Carey says hi, Dad. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> All right, here's another question. Um, J Car three fifteen. Are in person coaching sessions or weekend clinics an option? Absolutely, we do. In person, in person coaching sessions for an hour or three hour session or all day session, we call and schedule all that stuff. That's all on the schedule. We make sure we got the crew here, the shops covered, and then it's one on one or one on two or three or four. But yes, those are scheduled uh, and and scheduled in advance. We we put a date and a time on all those private lessons. All right, so we're missing a lot of questions that are coming in online. We're going to capture all those questions and do another video. Yeah. You're up for that, right? Sure. Yeah, because we're missing a lot, but we've been going for an hour ten. I've got three more, two more. You good okay. for them? I'm good. Okay. Um, Crow of the Mountain, Chris Crow. Oh, yeah. Says, Hey, Chris. Hey, Tom. I have to ask, how do you keep making the young bucks look bad? <laughs> He's talking about Zernzak, not me. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't make many of the young bucks look bad. It's my goal to have them all out shoot me, and a bunch of them are starting to out shoot me. That is my goal, is for them to beat the teacher. And nothing tickles me more than when they can do it. I'm not going to let them do it. And a lot of them have to work for a couple, two, three years to get her done. 
I'm definitely not going to let him do it, but it's my goal for all of them to outshoot me and, and make the old, the old guy look a little bad. All right. Heartland Boyer says, Been getting a touch of sore shoulder here lately. I've been trying to draw in a very relaxed state, forearm, hook, and bicep, using my back to draw. I have found that if I put some tension in the draw arm shoulder during this setup, it is easier on my shoulder, and I can still shoot with back tension. Is my corrective action the correct thing to be doing? I feel the better my shot gets, the more in tune I am getting with my body, and yeah. vice versa. Yeah, yeah, all, all that's good. You know, um, you know, you got to focus on where you start to draw from, of course. But I have to kind of get some tension in my right shoulder, keep it down and back to start my draw. If I'm drawing from up here, that that's not going to be good. So when I'm going from set to set up, I have to get some tension in here to keep it low and as back as I can. We're shooting low brace height, heavy poundage hunting bows, so that's not easy. It usually, you know, by the time we get coiled here, it's a reach up there. If we don't reach, we're bracing the bow. Yeah, that's going to take some tension here to hold that baby down, and that does reduce pain. I've, I've felt it myself. Anything, if you've got pain, stop. If you found a way to get pain gone, green light. Uh, like I said before, and I'll say it anytime, anything you're doing that's hurting you every time, stop doing that. We may have to go to a high draw and come down from here or jump out of like what we teach with this movement. We, we may need to get to this movement. We need to get away from whatever strands of muscle, whatever muscle group injured. We may, we've got to get the stress off of it. So yes, I do the same same thing, buddy. I get, I get some tension in this shoulder so when I coil, I can keep that down and back and then start to draw the load. I like what you're doing. All right, here's the last one we got. Um, Seneca, Inc., can you explain the preferred setup for a limb clicker? Um, I'm going to let Tommy help on this. We, we set those things up. I kind of like them at the end of the fade-out or so. I don't like to get them too high because there's not a lot of movement from the string away from the limb up high, but the angle down lower gets a lot more movement for a little less effort. So I'm, I'm usually down below the fade-out a little bit is where I like to center them. Um, we like to put D-loop cord, you know, we'll nip off the chain, chain we'll get D-loop, we'll take the clicker apart, <clears throat> put the D-loop cord through there, start bringing it in and tamping it down till we build a head on that that, you know, catches on the whole pull on the clicker. You know, we've done a lot of split string and then we tie knots and slide it back through for length. Sometimes if those sliding up and down, we don't have a lot of twists, we'll put a little serving up and below and above it to keep it that clicker cord from sliding up and down. Uh, a lot of times now uh, we're putting a little adjustment right in the middle of it, a little slip knot. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's on, on YouTube. Yeah, somewhere. no, it's not. But that's, I purposely read this question to force us to give him a, a more in-depth answer with the video. Because we've got some good ways to set up clickers where you can adjust your brace height and not have to take the whole clicker apart. You can uh, even swap limbs or swap strings and make it an easy change. You can change the you can change the length really easy. So we've got some good ways to do that, Seneca. We'll get uh, we'll get a video up. I'm saying it live on on this to force me to do it because we've be. been meaning to do it anyway. So we'll get that video up and answer that question in more detail. So that pretty wrap, pretty much wraps it up yep. for the questions that we got before this video. Yeah, we got a lot during the video. We'll, we'll do this again. We'll do this again here. Uh, we've got coaching moments up on the Push Archery Podcast. We'll be doing more coaching moments there too. And no doubt some more Q&As with, with Matt and Tim also. Yeah. And thanks for sticking with us guys for our first video. First time trying this out. I hope we'll, this was helpful guys. We'll be getting better at it. Yeah. All right. Thanks guys.